and uh, get that started. So again, thank you all for joining us. Malcolm, we're going to extend the conversation in personal and business finance to our last segment. And we're going to start off today with cash flow. So if anytime you'll open up your um, presentation and we'll start from there. And again, feel free to jump in the comment section if you have any questions. All right, I'm ready for the screen to load. Here we go. Cash flow analysis. This section is so crucial. Um, right now, it's just uh, we're going to have <clears throat> two slides here, uh, two or three slides. Um, but what I want to do is going to, uh, one, go over two, two, I guess, frameworks or, I guess, conversations that I, that I want the class to be able to have after this, this, this course. The first conversation is with yourself. What does cash flow analysis mean for your particular business? Or you know, if you're a trainer trainer, how do you articulate this to an entrepreneur? And then the second conversation is to an institution. So how do I communicate you know, this conversation around cash flow analysis to a potential investor, um, to a, a banker, or you know, any anyone in that position? So that's what the main takeaway of this particular uh, uh, um, slice is going to be about. Um, so on the sli on the slide here, you have two boxes right here: cash flow equals income minus tax expenses minus taxes, and then down at below it says tax equals income minus expenses times the tax percentage. Now, what do these two terms mean? What what are we really referring to? Um, over here on the side, we have cash flow analysis help us in analyzing how money flows in into and out of your business. It can help you understand where your money is going and how much cash you have at any given time. What I really want to uh, focus on is cash flow analysis uh, comes from the three main um, statements that you're going to have as an entrepreneur. That is your balance sheet, your income statement. And then your uh, lastly cash flow statement. Um, first, before I continue on, are these are these statements familiar to anyone? As is, are these new terms? Um, is is everyone vaguely familiar with these terms or these ideas? Before I continue on, raise your hand. Excuse me, raise your hand in the chat vaguely. All right, vaguely. Sweet. Thank you. Thank you, Angel. Uh, Michelle, please. Just uh, vaguely. I was just raising my hand to say vaguely. Okay, awesome. So it's, I'm glad you guys spoke up because I don't want to take this information for granted. These terms, balance sheet, income statement, cash flow statement, these are all terms that, for lack of better words, when you go to a business, um, if you go to like a bank, if you go to a VC, shoot, if you go to your rich uncle, <laughs> if you go to anybody with some money that can lend, they're going to look for these three documents. And these three documents, if you're doing it ethically and legally, should talk to each other and be symmetrical about each other. Um, I'm going to try to search up an example here. Um, there's not one in the slides that I thought would be. Um, Actually, I got you, Malcolm. You go ahead and go forward with it. And right, I'll, so I'll talk no, examples in there for you. Yeah. If you can't show, if you can't find one that shows a diagram, I used to have one in my car from school, and I don't know where it is, but if you can find like the diagram that shows how they, they talk to each other, because that's the main goal is that they communicate to each other. Um, and you can see this in a 10K. We can see this in a, you know, in other examples, what I mean. These terms um, arise from the fact that we talked about earlier that if you're an entrepreneur, whether you sell a product, whether you um, are selling a service, you are effectively in this particular case going to be generating some income part of generating some income is you incur some expenses so we use satoshi as an example satoshi is going to be uh um selling shirts right and he's going to sell them at a at a out of margin and to be able to sell a shirt he has to first buy the shirt so, shirt, so that's an expense and as he's doing this online and selling to different states, there's going to be different state taxes that, you know, each person, each state is going to charge per, you know, shirt that he sells, et cetera. And so 
that in that particular case, the cash, the the three statements that will that Satoshi will create in this scenario is going to be one, the balance sheet, which is going to have his shirts and as inventory on one side, and on the other side as an expense is going to be the accounts payable. Um, you know, the, the vendor that sold him the shirts, he's going to have to pay them at some given time period, typically net 30, 30 days. So that's going to be on one document. On the second document is going to be uh, an income statement, and it's going to show Satoshi's, you know, big cartel website or, you know, wherever his website, and it's going to show how many shirts he sold and how much he charged for them. And then how much he was charged for shipping. And that's going to be all the, you know, that's going to be his income and expenses. Okay. And then Satoshi's going to get one more document. And uh, hopefully Steve here will show, show this. I know I'm talking a lot, but the goal is to show this in a second. Satoshi's going to get one more, have to create one more document. And that document is going to be uh, the warrant, uh, the cash flow statement. And that's going to show. The first, all the activities of the first two statements into one. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to show this in a second. Give me a second. Okay, here we go. I'm gonna have to show this. So the slide this slide is a cash flow statement example. Excuse me, this website is a cash flow statement example. We got this in the chat here. These are for accounting basics. So in this particular example, um the the way to read these statements, first and foremost, the way to read these statements is a proper cash flow statement should have more or less four major sections to look for. And then under those sections are going to be um, typically the type of activities you experience in a, the different business, you know, flavor that you experience. So the first section we're going to be looking at is cash flow from operating activities. And if we looked at some of these sections here, you'll see cash from receipts from customers by 83,000. And then it's cash paid after suppliers. So uh, Satoshi's example, you know, if you were in selling, um, selling shirts, he made $83,000. You know, he got in $83,000 in cash from selling the shirts. He had to pay $25,000 in to uh, suppliers, another $25,000 in, say, the employees that, you know, packaged up the shirts and sent them out. And then just another $8,000 in effort and just general operating expenses for a net of $27,000. These examples are for a corporation. So let's play pretend and they're not here. But it, um, down here, you'll see cash flow from investing activities. Um, and the, in this example for Satoshi, we can you know play pretend and say that uh, Satoshi got uh, some VC money from Sequoia Capital. They like, man, these shirts are baller. They're so awesome. Like, we got to get you set up. So if they were to if he were to raise money and you know get a check from venture from sequoia capital for 10 million dollars or in this case nine million dollars and he were to invest it what would that do what would that look like so in this case satoshi would have spent you know 2.5 of that nine million or so in equipment and another seven million or so to replace equipment and let's say he sold a, a shirt make it you know three thousand and so that all to come to net at nine million. I'm going to take a pause here because I realize I'm going over a lot of different numbers and examples. So um, let me know if this is first of all makes sense or if this is um, helpful in any sort of way by raising your hand and or commenting in the chat. Okay, let's get that question right away here. Let me go ahead and put this. Uh, I thought somebody had. Yes, it makes sense. Okay, very good. Um, which which document do you end with? If you're a business owner, which document would you end with? Would you end with the balance sheet, the income statement, or cash flow?
which document of the three, the balance sheet, the income statement, or cash flow, which one would be the final document that you create? Very good, Angel. Thank you very much. It is the cash flow. It is the cash flow because it takes in the sum of the other ones. Okay. So the cash flow is like the icing on the cake. And sometimes people want to skip ahead and get to that. But the cash flow is the statement that is the one that you would ultimately end with. Okay. Um, so of all these statements, is there a possibility to have error in your statements? Is there a possibility to have error? For human error. For human error. So I love that as we segue, Malcolm, go ahead and take this one down if you don't mind. We're going to segue and move on into our next slide because what you just said, there's always a possibility for what? Human error. And, human uh, errors. Human errors. errors. So we've created some technologies right? Mistakes. Thank you, Angel. We've created some technologies that will allow for people to do what? To have automation. And now Malcolm has pulled up this slide. We're going to, we're going to both deep dive into some of these here. Go ahead, Malcolm. You can start first. Yeah, I'm sorry. Sorry. I was on mute there. Um, I'm trying. I'm doing my best to sort of pace here because I realize that what these concepts that we're discussing are typically courses at different colleges and whatnot. So the goal here is to give you a more direct application and, and story here. We just went over the three documents that each one of you in, in the, in, as either entrepreneurs or training other entrepreneurs have to be able to talk to. And those same three documents you'll be able to have to be able to speak to outside of not only your media friendship group, but um, to investors and, and financiers. And so the way to sort of generate those documents is tools, or excuse me, our tools like Google Sheets, um, Wave, which is an accounting tool, FreshBooks, was a net, which is another way to keep track of accounting, QuickBooks, and so forth and so forth. Um, the goal here is that these softwares are designed to take the headache out of generating those three documents or designed to aid in creating those three, those, the headache of creating those three documents so that your business has information parity. Um, and the old adage of garbage in, garbage out really does apply to whether it's a small business all the way up to the largest organizations, you know, in, in, in our economy. Um, and so, each the I'll go down here each list here of um, mapping the the software and its application and then really what helps me is the conversations that I would try to have with these softwares. So going first right off the bat, Google Sheets. As you know, kind of innocuous as this may be, this tool is useful for a lot of different uh, um, immediate sort of bootstrapping entrepreneur activities, ranging from tracking expenses, tracking revenues, um, implementing templates to keep track of budgets. And so if you have a, a clean enough Google Sheets, you know, um, you're able to scale your business you know, from zero to that first couple thousand, hundred thousand or so, um, being an effective user of Google Sheets, um, which is free, so hey. I don't know about y'all, but free. So second is another tool would be Wave. Wave is a, a accounting tool that's used by a number of different, um, both we'll say small to mid-market businesses. By mid-market, I'm talking zero to about five million or so in revenue. And what Wave will allow you to do, I don't know if you can see in the screenshot here, um, but in the slides where you zoom in, um, what it allows you to do is <clears throat> connect your um, business accounts, in this case, your business, your Chase Banking or your American Express, whatever, you know, whoever you're using as your financing um, or whoever you're getting credit from, connect those accounts to your uh, to to Wave Accounting 
And as you're getting different transactions, as transactions are rolling through, you're able to categorize these transactions and get real insight, real time insight into your cash flow and profit and loss. And so the goal here is that Wave has a function that generates the cash flow statement for you or generates the balance sheet of profit and loss state or, you know, income statement for you. And so being able to be literate to that or talk to that and read these different line items and understand what counts as an expense, you know, how do you treat accounts receivables or how do you treat different credit um, transactions that you do um, all correlate to the different activities that arise from cash flow. Now, Malcolm, isn't this a, isn't this kind of crazy? Cause we were just talking about those three type of sheets and then all of a sudden now we come over here to some free software, but Google Sheets doesn't do anything for you. It requires what? Human input, right? Yep. And Wave, Wave has a little bit of AI that's involved, right, in terms of their programming language and moving things forward. But Wave also requires you to go back in and to look at how they, how they, um, how they uh, categorize things. And most of the time, Wave will put things in the uncategorized location. What's the point here, Malcolm? We're, we're really trying to, to tell everybody in the class, if you're a trainer, if you're an entrepreneur, we're trying to tell you that there are, there are um, programs that can support you, but these programs are not a complete solution because you still have to go back in and check the programs, no matter if you're using QuickBooks, Quick and Home, all of these programs still require human interpretation and human oversight. So in a normal sense, you think about what was business normal in 1980, business normal in 1990. The business normal was if you're a business owner, you have an accountant. If you're a business owner that has a little bit more money, you have a bookkeeper and an accountant. And the bookkeeper will do all the things that these programs do. So the question is, is the bookkeeper still relevant? Well, that's a, that's what I want to put out to the, to the room. Is the bookkeeper still relevant? And have you all used these software tools in your life? Just go ahead and write it in the chat box. Is the bookkeeper still relevant? And have you used these software tools in your life? Thank you, Tomorrow. Tomorrow says yes. Ray says that's a deep question. It is kind of a loaded question. Ray's right. Um, Satoshi says, I'm going to say yes, um, that they are. Um, Edith says, I haven't used the software. Michelle says, yes, I teach Excel. Okay. Yes, but you should always watch your own books and view all receipts. Apollonia is throwing out some gems, some great knowledge because it seems like she may be familiar with entertainment and sports culture, where there are athletes that have for long let their uncles and their friends be their bookkeepers and accountants, only to find themselves being broke. Broke. Oh, that's the exact same word I was looking for. I know sometimes you all think Malcolm and I have this kind of uh, mental telepathy going on, but it's just that it makes sense. It just makes sense. Yes, Apollonia. Yeah, it's, it's crazy because right before the class, I was like watching Donald Trump's uh, YouTube audio book. Uh, one of his audio books was Think Like a Billionaire. And he was actually saying to like review all your books and check all your receipts and don't rely on anyone to review, not even your like accountant or bookkeeper to make sure you check everything. And every, make sure every you know where every cent is going. So that's kind of where I got that from. Donald well, Trump. I appreciate you doing that. <laughs> I appreciate I appreciate you citing a reference. This is something very important, and uh, because we are uh, we are in this kind of uh, junction of uh, doing in kind work, uh, we will uh, let that reference sit alone um, and not not uh, not divert our attention to uh, the uh, connoisseur. The participant and the recipient in in that and we will say that we appreciate you citing that resource the resource is pertinent you do need to check your own business books now you say i'm not good at math i don't want to 
deal with that. Fine. Fine. You have you acknowledge that you have some area of weakness, but you know what? Is there anyone in this class not capable of asking questions? If you're capable of asking questions, go ahead and put a question mark in the chat box. <laughs> I love it. I love it. You know why? Because I may I may not want to do something, but I should know enough to ask questions about what has been finished for or completed in my business. So if a bookkeeper comes back and after you got the bookkeeper to do the work, you hand it over to the accountant and the accountant does your work and comes back with a cash flow. And what do they say to you? They say, here's your cash flow. Let's look at the numbers. Oh, OK, let's shoot. The cash flow came back and I'm looking at the numbers and I'm thinking, OK, am I, am I impressed by this? Let's see here. After I take the income minus the expenses minus the taxes, I made two thousand dollars. Nah, something's wrong here. So then you go back into the expenses. And what do you ask the bookkeeper? Hey, what did you count as a uh, as an expense? And come to find out they may have counted your capital contribution because humans can make mistakes. They can categorize things incorrectly. Does anyone know what the credentials are to be a bookkeeper? What credentials are mandatory for you to be a bookkeeper? Anyone? Ding, 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 ding. Ray has said it. Ray has said it. There are none. There are none. Not the same as being a CPA or a licensed professional counselor or a medical doctor or a certified engineer or um, a veterinarian or a dentist uh, or, or uh, 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 a nail, someone who does your nails, a cosmetologist, someone who does your hair. There, there's just no certifications necessary uh, globally for that type of thing or nationally. So sometimes it doesn't mean that you need a certification to be legitimate. It's just that the standards aren't equivocal across the board. That's all I'm saying to you all. OK, so learn to ask questions. And that's why we ask you all to ask us so many questions, because when you ask us questions, that's right. Assets minus liabilities equals equity or in more lay terms. If you made five hundred dollars this month, but you spent six hundred dollars, did you make money? I am asking a question. I want everybody to answer that question. If if you made five hundred dollars. But you spent six. So this is the problem in schools. We don't teach children what? That your assets minus your liabilities equals your equity. Because we give them sometimes an artificial, an artificial equity. They end up getting their allowance no matter that they spent five to six to ten to a hundred times their allowance. They think I still have money coming in. But what you do is you say, let me teach you a little language. It's going to be called assets mm -hmm. minus liabilities equal equity. And you can start them fairly young. I don't think I'm breaking any laws by saying this. Let's say you have a 10 year old you want to teach about money. You say, well, you have a bed in a room. That bed is going to cost you five dollars to sleep in every night. Now, I will pay you to do chores. I'm going to pay you five dollars a day to do chores. OK, so they think to themselves, well, huh, maybe they're a little slow at math. Maybe the math isn't something that they're excited about. So they're like they start working every day. And so at the end of a month, there's 30 days in the month. They have one hundred and fifty dollars from doing their chores every day. And then you come in, you say, I'm, I'm ready to collect my rent. And he said, Mom, Dad, what, what was the rent amount? He said, you don't remember? Oh, no, I remember. I remember it was five dollars. That's right. Five dollars of rent. Was that for a week or for a month or for a day? They said, uh, I think you said a month, five dollars a month for my room to rent my bed. Oh, OK. So did that did that young child make money?
If they had $150 and their rent was only $5 a month, did they make money? No. <laughs> Absolutely, they made money. They made money because their, their assets was $150. Their liabilities was $5. It equaled $145 in equity. But what was the factor that was important? Them getting up and going to work every day because they didn't know enough to say, well, dang, if my rent's $5 and that's all my, my liabilities, well, I only need to work one day. But see, when they get to be 14 and 15, what do they say? They said, my rent $5 a month? And you say you pay me five dollars to do this chore? Cool, I'm gonna work one day a week. They'll come back with a little net income of fifteen dollars. Yes, you're right, Angel. That is hilarious because that's exactly what older the older they get, the less they want to do. So Malcolm pulled up here the Google Sheets. It's really hard to read if you're on your phone. If you're on your laptop, it still can be hard to read. But what it is is it gives you a detailed 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 look at an income sheet okay it gives you a detailed detailed look at an income sheet now malcolm just took it down because i think he's probably trying to make it larger but the idea is that that income sheet is very specific and it's called different things from time to time sometimes it can be called profit and loss statement but there's some variations there's some nuances that we don't have to dig into but Thank you very much, Malcolm. And so when he put it back up here, these are things that you can do yourself. Go ahead, Malcolm. I, I was just making sure this was better. I just realized that I, everyone might be on their phone and maybe in, in, in motion or something. So I wanted to um, make sure this was sort of clear, you know, to the mind's eye. Um, like, like Steve mentioned, what we have on the screen is an income statement. Um, and like, like I mentioned earlier, these statements are formatted. So like I mentioned before, the cash flow statement has uh, typically has four sections um, as much. Uh, similarly, the income statement will have um, its own set of sections. In this particular case, is three. The income, the expenses, and then the net profit. Um, and depending on your organization, there's all these different, you know, different definitions of profit, EBITDA, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the main takeaway here in this particular example is the income line item is pretty simple. They just provide services and they made around $94,000, $95,000 from those services. And then from the expenses, um, which is what I want to get more granular here is you can learn so much about a business from reading expenses. I can't tell you how easy how lucky i am to be able to just read an income statement be able to read someone's financial statements and pretty and get a pretty good understanding of what their day in their life is like um because these again um the the mental model here is that your expenses should should be at parity with your balance sheet should be at parity with your cash flow statements so malcolm what's your red flag malcolm what's the red flag for you you, your eyes have been experienced. It'd be like you're a, you're an obstetrician. You go in to deliver babies. It's like it's no sweat. You've done it 3,000 times. You're going in. You're taking a look. You're like, baby's coming out. We see cresting. Okay, that's going to happen here. Next five minutes. Okay, we're good to go. When you see that balance sheet, what's that thing that gets you? What's that thing that stands out to you that gives you the red flag immediately? Yeah, so for I guess for in this particular case, I'm looking at an income statement. If this income statement, let's say for example, um, the line item here for fuel, uh, no, no, no. Say for example, the line item here for stationery. Right now, it says four four hundred and twelve bucks. If that four hundred and twelve was say the water and electricity, like sixteen thousand, something like that, that would be a red flag to me. Or something as even as boring as the, you know, it may seem boring, but something that says like bank charges. If for a services business, if that bank charges number was even remotely close to 20 or 15% of the overall net profit, I'd be like, what is going on here? Right now it's less than that. It's, you know, it's less than um, 10%. So, but so Malcolm, we're saying that you're, you're telling us 
you telling us because I want to make sure I hear you right because I know people are going to listen to this later and think, wait, what did he just say? You're saying that if the function of your business is hairstyling, that's what your business is. It's a service you offer. And you come back with an expense that doesn't have anything related to or has a percentage being spent too high that doesn't make sense for a hairstylist, then someone like Malcolm would be like, wait a second, how is this associated with styling hair? Am I right, Malcolm? Yeah, and and uh, the people who, who look at these things have a team, oftentimes have a team, and that's who you're presenting this information to. So that's why we kind of slowed the course down and went through went this granular about this. You're often presenting this information, this information meaning the cash flow statement, the balance sheet, the, the, the income statement. You're often presenting this to a team of people. And these team of people have the time or typically have the time and the know-how to, to scrutinize and read through these things and, and drill, drill you on these questions or um, investigate on these questions. And so we would like to take the time here to prepare you on this and have you kind of think on that. So uh, I realize I'm talking a lot about this income statement, but I want to take a moment here to say, uh, to say, does any of this sinking in or expanding, you know, existing um, areas of, of weakness or, or confusion? Feel free to open it, you raise your hand or, you know, comment in the chat. Oh, Edith, thank you. Awesome, Edith, I appreciate that. It says, Michelle says, yes, Angel, yes, awesome. Because I can go on this all day, so that's why I'm like, let me take a break here and make sure the team is good, make sure y'all understand what we're doing here because this is critical. Being able to communicate this, talk about this to not only other entrepreneurs, but to the people who have the money will make or break your quality of life. I cannot stress this enough. Because so. we're talking about e-literacy, we're talking about digital literacy, we're talking about e-commerce. And one of the things that's fascinating about the uh, evolution of technology is that people, it, it, it gave everybody an option. Now, can you leave your mic open for me? You know, I'm going to have a little dialogue yeah. here. It gave, it gave everybody an option to... To, to now have a business without having to go to their local banking institution or take from 12 to 15 years of savings to start renting a commercial property. Now, anyone that had access to the internet could do what? They can look up the, they can open up an account. They can, you know, access their, their, their transaction information. Like all the stuff that used to be analog is now digital you know it used to be analog to go open up to go get a cashier's check to go open up a bank account to go get some of your you know balance sheet statements you can do all that from your mobile device for the most part not only that but the business structure itself that's what i'm saying e-commerce is what we're here for this digital literacy the overhead expense that would be here in expenses on your balance because i want to i want to take it back to the income statement i want to take it back to something that make it tangible for you before you used to have to have a brick and mortar building to do business and that would show up as a very large expense but things have changed things have changed you might find things in your expenses called um it security contract versus versus something over here before it used to be basically just a network and engineering person okay so when you talk about your salaries your salaries even change because now you're contracting people out to do work for you as opposed to having full-time employees if you run zero brick and mortar business which can be done with drop shipping businesses with um, with certain media type of businesses, digital media type of businesses where you're selling your music and things of that nature, your artwork. If you have a need for brick and mortar today in today's e-commerce environment, it would solely, almost solely be for warehousing. OK, warehousing or production. OK, so. Does, does that does that make sense to everybody? The goal is to lower your overhead, which your overhead would end up on your income sheet, your income statement, excuse me. 
Yeah, just put word in the chat if this if you get it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just yeah. want to make sure this is as crystal clear as possible. Thank you. Awesome. All right, let's keep going on here because I'm sure there's other. Yeah, people. let's drop down into our next one here, Malcolm. I think we're gonna be into our um, into our our pricing, which I gotta tell you all, I have been waiting on this pricing point. I know I brought it in with Satoshi earlier, but this pricing stuff, it, it is also a make or break for your business because you can price yourself into success or you can price yourself right out of the market. You can offer yoga services. I think uh, I don't know if Andrea is, uh, is here with us today. Um uh, she's not, but it's okay. But uh, yeah, you can, you can, you can, you can take a yoga cause she did, she does yoga. You could take her, her yoga class. And if she's charging people $150 for a 45 minute session of yoga, but you have somebody down the road doing the exact same quality customer service of yoga for $45, who do you think people are going to go to? The forty-five dollar one. Mm -hmm. If everything is exactly the same except the price, but have you all ever heard? And then you got tell me honest. I want y'all to be honest. Be honest with me. Have you ever went and bought something that was more expensive, even though you knew it was the exact same thing that you could get cheaper, but because the brand label was on it, you wanted to buy the brand label. Come on now, let's let's just be honest with each other. This is what this class is about. Have you ever knew that there was some equivalent product and you went and bought the equivalent product for more? And Apollonia raised her hand on that. She, I guess that's a yes. <laughs> so, so, so when I say equivalent product, I'm not going to make it about about purses and bags, because you know that's one of the first things people want to talk about. Let, let's talk about pharmaceutical drugs. They have Claritin during allergy season, and they have the generic brand offered by CVS, by Walgreens, used to be a place called Eckerd's. Walmart has their generic brand. And, and guess what? When you look at the ingredient, the active ingredient, it's the exact same. Now tell me, what part of the business strategy worked to get you to pay almost 100% more for a product based on a brand name? Malcolm, what do you think it is? Oof. I'm going to try to keep it short, man, because they, they, they go deep into this. It boils down to brand marketing and brand orientation or, you know, brand strategy, however you want to use that. But their ability, my assumption is that the firm's ability to instill a sense of trust or a sense of authority around being an allergy brand, you know, leader, convince people to want to pay more versus just getting a generic, you know, alternative. So, so, so he spoke directly to the, the Claritin, but we can speak like this for almost everything from going to the grocery store for milk to choosing, uh, to choosing which soft drink to drink. There's something about that brand recognition. And I want you to consider you're putting your new market, your, your new product or service out into the market. Um, I think we have Andrew on the line here as well. Andrew, could you open up and tell, um, is Andrew still with us here? Andrew might have jumped off. Um, let's see here. Tomorrow, could you open up and tell me about a product that you sell, please? Or a service that you offer? The service that we offer is hair, so uh, wigs, basically. Um, and when you think about, it's kind of versatile depending on a lot of people get their hair from China, but it doesn't mean that it's good quality hair. It can shed a lot or either it can be very thin when you're looking at, you know, frontals and sewing hair into people's head. Now, I know my hair is beautiful tomorrow, but I let's say I want to wake up one day and I want to get me a nice piece. OK, 
How, how much is that going to cost me? My head, my head is about the size of an average head. I think I got a big old head, but let's say it's the size of an average head. Anywhere from three to three hundred to a thousand dollars. Okay, and is this going to cover my whole head? Yeah, it'll cover your whole head. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so, the, so you all that you all that that know that don't they can't see this because you're watching the um the live uh recording uh, uh one of our one of our uh people in the chat uh, uh, Edith has said that 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 ten a hair that ten a hair so could you tomorrow could you explain what that means in terms of someone who sells hair what that means. The 10A hair that she's talking about is the quality of hair, basically. When you were saying it's shedding, you can't comb through it, and you for sure can't wash it. Some of the hair you can wash and reuse over and over for a year or two, right? It depends on how much money you spend for the quality of the hair. Now, now, tomorrow, do you would you say you are in the vanity business? Vanity business, maybe. Oh, come on now. Come on. Help me out. Help me out. <laughs> Are you in the vanity business? Uh, okay. I can go with that. I, I can go with that. Okay. So so now that we know what, what sector we're in, what other things do you think fall in the vanity business? Um, If you think about it, makeup, eyelashes, everything that has to do with looks. Everything that has to do with looks. Would we say, uh, could we, could we, could we put plastic surgery in there as well? Well, I can't do no plastic surgery, but yeah. <laughs> okay. So we're going to throw that in the vanity pool. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so let's say, let's say we have it like this. Okay. So let's say a person has an option to get plastic surgery, which are going to get each little hair implanted into their head. Okay. Okay. Let's say I, I went, I want to get some done to my beautiful head. Okay. Mm -hmm. I put a little bit in my head. Okay. Now, tomorrow, you said 300 to 1,000. Mm -hmm. Do you have a ballpark in your mind of how much it would cost me to have actual individual hair implants? Put in your head. We're talking about $3,000 or more now. We've moved up the, the spectrum. So, it's individually you, put in uh -huh. each. Hair strand, yeah. Each hair strand, yeah. Each okay, hair strand, that's a lot more money. That's like asking for a tummy tuck. Okay, so and for those that that are new to those type of words, a tummy tuck is uh, it, there's several ways that that can happen. But if you consider your abdomen, um, this is a procedure that is done in plastic surgery. You all can definitely look it up and see live video of how it's done. But this is also a procedure where people decide that this might be a route to take for health. They might decide to take this route for vanity. They may decide to take this route because they had an accident. And so, um, but let's say that it was for vanity, okay? Because obviously all love and respect for everybody that has to do anything with their body. There's no shame here. This is all inclusive. So if it were for vanity, the equivalent of a tummy tuck to exercise would be equivalent to the cost of single individual hair implants to purchasing a hair piece okay so if tomorrow says she's gonna charge me a thousand dollars for a hair piece but it would cost me three thousand to get the procedure done minimum is tomorrow setting her price equivalent to what the market offers for a permanent solution and then also in terms of the competition for obtaining those hair pieces is she setting her price equivalently correct for competing against the permanent solution of having implanted hair yes or no y'all can write it in the text box you can raise your hand could you ask and tomorrow question? tomorrow what do you think i guess i'll, I'll ask the question again angel if 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 tomorrow is setting her a thousand dollar price for a male hair piece, okay, equivalent to uh, the hair piece, uh, equivalent to the surgical implants or individual implants, minimum three thousand dollars, is her price point competitive to the permanent solution with the temporary and changeable solution of hair pieces?
unless her service is permanent. Okay. No, I believe I believe that she's selling one. And if you want more, you got to come get some. If you if you if you mess it up, if you burn it, wash it, sweep it, vacuum it up. You have to go get another one. Am I wrong tomorrow? Correct. Okay. So let's see if she can funnel those people to a specific place that does them. She can raise those prices. Very interesting. Very interesting. Very interesting. Do we have a hand raise here? Very interesting. Okay. So I believe, I believe we're in the right direction here. Malcolm, I want you to jump back on here. Let's go down into some of the numbers here and, and see if it makes sense for you all here in terms of the formula. I know y'all can read the slide, but Malcolm, let's, let's give them a little bit more. Okay. <coughs> Were you over there laughing at me, Malcolm? <laughs> yeah, I just want to make sure. Well, <clears throat> I'm laughing because I know that uh, we just went over pricing from, uh, from tomorrow's example, but there really is a lot. Uh, there, There's a whole industry around what Steve just talked about for five minutes. There's, there's consultants. I can't tell you how many consultants and bankers and all these people who make a whole career out of telling someone else this this slide, how you should price cost materials, how you should price cost labor, how you should look at overhead, and then what is, and then what this total cost plus desired profit margin should be, and then we then we back into the required sales price. Like there's an entire multi-billion dollar industry around this, and um, you know the goal with Using make tomorrow as an example, which we appreciate, um, you know, play, you know, engaging with us shows you how even at you know, no matter what scale you're at in your business, this still matters. These are still the, the fundamental building blocks of a robust and repeatable process. Um, so to continue on with uh, these two different examples. So let me take a step back here. In this particular example, this will be an. Uh, this is a formula for using cost plus pricing. This is typically found um, in industries. Uh, well, first and foremost, this can be found in both product and service related industries. And the notion here is you effectively back work backwards from a sale. You're trying to find a sales price to um, deliver to the customer. And in order to get to that sales price, you factor in the cost of materials, labor, operating, and then you try to um, build in a desired profit margin. Um, an example would be designer um, bags. Um, there, that this margin, this number right here, this twenty percent, yeah, at like a zero, or or change the two and zero to like <laughs> four zero zero. They, they, that's why the, this stuff costs so much. So that's an example of cost plus pricing. Um, and a, and a, um, an example of competitive pricing, hmm, I guess it'd be like, <clears throat> excuse me. I guess it'd be uh, like Google ads or um um, like web services or even even hair like hairstylists if you ever go to like a really nice hair beauty salon um these different competitive price the competitive pricing is um i say dynamic because what ends up happening what ends up happening is there's a time delay which is not shown here in the slide but there's this time interval between competitor one doing something and then you know my and you seeing competitor one and then competitor two seeing competitor you know, one and then yourself. And then, so these prices start to change and you start to iterate. And, and so that's why um, I use this term dynamic or competitive pricing because it's multi, there's a lot of dimensions that go into these numbers. Um, I'm gonna keep going on here. I wanna stop here at creating a vision plan. And the reason why I wanted to transition from pricing into a vision plan is because if you're not able to see really the value of your service and how to price your service, you know, how to, if you're going to go for a cost plus or going to start off maybe doing competitive pricing, 
you got to be able to build those those you know and those fundamental concepts feed into those three statements we mentioned earlier the balance sheet the income statement the cash flow statement all of that correlates into um, a really sharp vision and plan and the sharper and more crisper the plan the uh, the easier it is not only communicated to yourself but to others and um, like I keep, uh, I will keep iterating that the goal of this class is not is not just to, you know, teach you the listener on this call, but really enable you to have this conversation outside of this call. So um, I want to take a pause here because I realize we're almost uh, at seven thirty, and if there's any questions, uh, we can take them now. If not, um, if the class would like, we can start to look into how to create a vision plan because I think we did a really excuse me i think um having a conversation about finance finances and how to have the the right tools to measure the the right mental model to keep track of things and um be mindful of people's of of, of human error really inform us on a on a vision and a plan that enable us to get to the quality we look quality of life we're looking for so let me pause here uh, if you have questions, please put them in the chat or raise your hand if you prefer. All right, I'll take that as people want to move forward. We we know that the class is supposed to complete itself at seven thirty. Um, this this how to create a vision and a plan is a single slide basically, and then there's some activity work that is given that will allow for you all to interact uh, with this material outside of us this week okay so the more challenging thing is we're going to ask uh we're going to ask uh ray in his uh with the if he could put it into the uh into the the meeting invite um to uh to to this this kind of information that we're having on this slide here for you all so that you all are able to look at it uh this week before you get back to us again on wednesday because uh, it's important for you to dig down into it. Um, and so not just not the not the goal and vision setting, but the activity that will follow <sighs> the, the this this concept of of setting a setting a vision for yourself goes hand in hand with everything in business. And because we're getting to that vision part, we feel that we've given you all enough business fundamentals before getting to this part about dreaming, because oftentimes entrepreneurs have no problem dreaming. Dreaming is one of the best things that you do, right? How many of y'all had a dream? I know that might be symbol symbolic of the Dr. King speech, but how many of you had a dream? One day you had a vision, uh, an encumbrance to your flow of thought that said, I want to be this. I want to make this. I want to do this. Did anyone have that thought? Angel had that thought. Apollonia had that thought. Satoshi had that thought. The, the thing about it is Tamara said they had that thought. So if you had that thought, then with that thought, then there had to come some action but having a dream without a goal is just a dream i've mentioned that before it isn't mine i don't own that statement that statement came from some very famous person you all know before tomorrow do you have a, a question or statement no i meant to put my hand down oh no it's okay it's okay it's okay and then without that without that that when you look at that goal, a goal without actually working that goal, without creating a plan for that goal, it's just nice talk. Maybe you just like to get around your friends at a pub or 
around dinner or like to go have some coffee and tea and talk about all your big dreams, your fancy goals. But maybe you haven't done the work to make a vision of where those things are going to go. You haven't done the things to make it an outline. That isn't to put you down. Sometimes we just like sitting in our accomplishments. When you learn to tie your shoes for the first time, you had to go do what? When you practice learn to tie Bible. your shoes, you had to go practice, <laughs> but you went and go, you went and go tell somebody, right? You had to go tell somebody. I learned how to tie my shoes. <laughs> first time you bought a car, it could have been used or new. What'd you do? Flex. That's right. You got to tell somebody. <laughs> got to tell somebody. All right. Shut go up. tell it. That's right. Go tell it. First time, some of you might have decided y'all was going to graduate from high school. Maybe you graduated from high school in the digital age where you could put it on TikTok. You could put it on Snapchat, Instagram. Maybe, maybe you graduated from college. And you want to let people know you got you a big old live. You got you a Twitch account. I'm dropping all these social media things because that's how people let the world know. They tweet about they let the world know about their accomplishments. Now, it's rare that you meet people like myself. Be like, oh, I did something cool today. Only the people that are in my phone are my favorites. know, And that's only if they ask me. They may ask me a year from now what I did. I'll tell them a year from now. But oftentimes, these things need to follow a process, a process. Now that you had your dream, you create your goal. Now you have a vision, but you need a plan. You need a plan. Malcolm, let's go a little deeper into that real quick for these people. The goal here, like Steve mentioned, um, because I know we're um, coming up in the last couple minutes here. Uh, the goal for this particular activity is really four sections. Um, if you haven't read it, I'm just going to go through them. Uh, first and foremost is to take some time to yourself and ask and uh, write down what is your vision um, and explain your business vision and plans for the future. For those who are doing the training, the trainer uh, section, I would like for you to write down how would you like to get the entrepreneur engaged to do this? So, you know, would you get them to physically write this down or maybe talk it out? And then uh, the second part is what sets you apart? And really, this just want to write down um, one to three sentences that describe uh, what do you what do you think your business is going to do differently and how you want to um, utilize your your uniqueness to solve problems. And then lastly is um, who, who you sell to. Um, really, I want you to identify your customer, and that's going to be audience, um, their budget, the, the day in their life, and the problems that they have. So just two, three sentences on both of those. So again, um, write down your vision and for your business. If you're a train the trainer, write down how you would like to get entre help entrepreneurs execute on their visions. Second is what makes you uh, write down your uniqueness and the problems that interest you. So, you know, how are you going to address the uh, businesses differently? And then lastly, um, identify your audience. So who are you going to be selling to? What is their life like? Um, and, you know, write the problem down. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to go ahead and sign it off unless any give oh, first of all we give like two minutes here if anyone has any questions um aside from that um we'll be signing off after that appreciate that edith <clears throat> we try to be as helpful as possible. I know this is a lot of topics into one, so I really appreciate the kind words. Thank you, Tamara. Thank you guys for the class.
And I just want to encourage um, everyone to take advantage of the Ren Center and that link that I sent you guys last week because they have a lot of free grant money available in the city of San Francisco right now. I literally just made like 20K in grants for my business just taking Zoom trainings over the past like six months. So take advantage of the free grants available, guys. Yeah. Yo, get it. Drop the link again, please, because, you know, sometimes I, I find it to be this way here. When people, when people think about what you say, and then when you tell them again and they think about what you say, then you tell them again and they think about what you say. And then you tell them again and then they finally hear you. Then be like, wait a second. Hold on a second. Did she just say that she made 20000 taking trainings, online trainings? I, I think it's worth recognizing. For her business, not 20K for someone else's business. That's the emphasis, man. <laughs> and so I want you all to recognize if it's out there and there's something actionable that you can do, then why not do it? And Apollonia, thank you so much for sharing that um, and that information. And we'll leave the chat open here for just a little while here. Uh, Ray has done a beautiful job of recording these. Uh, you can go back into our YouTube channel, I believe, and you can watch all these videos. Uh, Ray, if you, were, if you were around and have the opportunity to drop that link in here as well um, for the class, um, or they can just find it in the Google um, Meet, um, I think as well. Is that right, Ray? Yeah, absolutely. So there's there's two places you can find these videos. One in the folder that, that we share it with you. If you go to your Google Drive, um, you'll see a folder that's um, that specifically houses um, like all the chat information, like prior chats from, from prior classes, and then also the videos. Uh, but an easier way to just to access the videos is the YouTube link, and I can share that in just a bit here. We appreciate you so much, right? Appreciate you so much. Thank you. And um, Apollonia, Apollonia, you, you're gonna drop, you're gonna drop this uh, this link for everybody here one more time, because I think I think we have people staying on, holding their breath, waiting for that link again, because they just can't believe. <laughs> <laughs> yes, let me um let me uh check my email. Oh, oh, there Edith just put the link back in. Yes, it's with the Ren Center and uh with OEWD. After you finish the training with the Ren Center, um you get a you can sign up for a grant with OEWD and I believe the only uh qualifications is that you have to like um have like your business registered and have like a working website or like have your website up. Um, but they help you with like business plan and uh, consultants. It, it's it's just a great program, and the trainings alone are just worth worth it. Without the the grants, the grants is just extra. But I'm telling everyone about it. <laughs> and and then, and then, and I want to make clear that that everyone understands that you are not being compensated compensated as a paid endorser or sponsor of of uh, the Rin Center. Is that correct? No, absolutely not. I am a entrepreneur who signed up for the trainings and is just happy to share with my colleagues and my community that the money and the grants are out there and to take advantage because if we don't take advantage, then they're going to just go away. So, Absolutely love that. Support each other. If you know something out there that can benefit anyone else in the class, please do so. If you know a way to obtain uh, cash uh, for your business to do good in the community uh, as Apollonia is trying to do is to promote health and wealth within the community. Please make sure you share. Um, this is a thing where Malcolm Ray and I often have competition uh, uh, conversations about competition. And this is not an environment for competition. This is an environment to fuel resources to help more people. Right, Ray? Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, I think we've come to the end of our time here. We certainly appreciate you all, especially staying on with us. 
Um, you just can't know how much we appreciate you all taking your time to be with us. And we know that we've been holding classes a little bit longer, but we're doing so just so that we're able to cover enough material and uh, answer your questions. And if some of this material seems like, you know, it's too much or it's too little, uh, feel free to let us know. You're not hurting our feelings. We're here to provide the training to the trainers. And um, we are blessed to have so many entrepreneurs taking the train to trainer course because ultimately it helps us gauge do you think that this information would have been beneficial if taught by a trainer? So um, we certainly appreciate your time. And uh, if you all don't have any other questions, Malcolm. Yeah, uh, guys, have a, a blessed evening. All right, we're out. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Have a good evening. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.